Our next uh, Gilbreth uh, lecturer, Dr. Christra Geyer, is chief scientist at BAE Systems in Burlington, Massachusetts. Previously, he led research and development in uh, perception uh, for unmanned systems at iRobot Corporation. His interests include computer vision, robotics, human-machine interaction, robot and robot autonomy, uh, perception for unmanned vehicles in the air, on the ground, and underwater. He's kind of a man for all seasons. Dr. Geyer started his career in robotics in, in the GRASP lab at the University of Pennsylvania, where he earned a, a BS and a PhD in computer science in 1999 and 2002. His doctoral thesis earned him the Morris and Dorothy Rubinoff Award for Innovative Applications of Computer Technology. Starting in 2003, he was a postdoctoral scholar at the University of California, Berkeley, working on computer vision and automation for unmanned aerial vehicles. While at Berkeley, he led an effort to develop an autonomous landing capability for unmanned rotorcraft for the U.S. Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, also known as DARPA. Dr. Geyer joined the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon University in 2005 and led research in perception for aerial vehicles, including developing an onboard technology for sensing and avoiding general aviation aircraft by unmanned aerial vehicles. Sounds like a good idea. <laughs> Memorable activities include flying straight at another airplane at a closing speed of 200 miles an hour. I guess in living to talk about it, it makes it especially memorable. memorable. <laughs> he was also a member of CMU's Tartan Racing Team that won the first place in the DARPA Urban Challenge. At iRobot, he led efforts to give unmanned ground vehicles better perception capabilities and to endow their human operators with greater situa situational awareness. He has led de development of object and activity recognized research for DARPA as well as improvement to human interaction with robotics robots. Please welcome Dr. Christopher Geyer for the <laughs> Gilbreth Lecture. <laughs> Christopher, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Yours. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to be here to talk. I, I appreciate it. Uh, today I'll talk about robot navigation, uh, and I'll be talking about some of the frontiers. And I, I will treat that somewhat literally and talk about some things that are uh, unsolved. Frontiers are sparsely populated with researchers. Um, they're not, uh, and certainly not uh, guaranteed uh, in terms of outcomes but I think they're interesting problems about robotics and how they're going to affect uh, the world. Um, I think lots of folks think about robotics in the movies. iRobot, for example, is a movie, not just a company uh, and, a, and a story. Um, and Terminator, those are different types of movies. I'll talk a little bit about context of the movie uh, of robots uh, that have actually been successful out in the world, out, out in the real world, and have been sold, uh, and start with that. Um, First off, a long time ago, uh, in the 70s and, uh, 60s and 70s, really the, the first real robots to be used in the real world were for manufacturing, for manufacturing cars and so on. And that really started, uh, again, uh, in the 70s. Um, it wasn't until the last couple of decades that they got out into people's homes. Um, and they've proliferated, proliferated uh, over the last several years. We hear in the news uh, about drones, for example. Uh, 2001, the Global Hawk was introduced, uh, and right now that there are approximately 10,000 drones, maybe 10,000 um, unmanned ground vehicles that I'll talk about, uh, and also at this point today, on the order of 10 to the 7 uh, robots in our homes, for example, Roombas. iRobot, uh, the company that I used to work for, uh, has sold, on the, again, about 10 to the 7 robots that are now in homes. So those have... Uh, expanded over the last decade, okay? Um, and I was also um, involved in research for self-driving cars. Is that going to be part of what's next uh, for robots? I think that's a, a good question. I'll talk about some of the, the problems that, that we'll encounter on, on the road to that uh, uh, objective. Um, here's an example of a robot that iRobot makes. Um, and it's interesting, iRobot is one of the uh, only companies, it's one of the largest companies to be solely focused on selling robots. Uh, we looked at, or iRobot has considered, you know, what made, where have robots been successful, where have they been applied? Um, robots, really their sweet spot has been in tasks that are dull, boring, for example, manufacturing, 
uh, tasks that are, that are dirty. For example, uh, going into nuclear power plants. iRobot sent uh, packbots, their robots, into nuclear power plants. And in areas where they're dangerous. So the iRobot, this particular robot that you see here has been, um, is used in, in the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan to look at unexploded ordnance to see if there's, there's something suspicious, for example. Uh, <coughs> dull uh, also includes, for example, going where no uh, person has gone before, behind a toilet, for example. Um, <laughs> uh, domestic cleaning might be a dull, as well as a dirty task, of course, but also, as I said, industrial, industrial robots. A recent example is um, Amazon's purchase of Kiva Systems, which is uh, roboticizing warehouses, allowing the transfer of goods so that orders can be fulfilled much more efficiently in, in those warehouses. Dirty includes, um, in addition to um, uh, cleaning behind toilets, for example, also this particular robot, which is called the Sea Glider, which was sent into the Gulf of Mexico to uh, look at the oil plume and measure that oil plume as it was spreading uh, from the leak. That's an example of a dirty application. Another being mining, uh, where there are um, still ongoing work by Caterpillar to, to automate uh, the uh, mining in, uh, across the world. Um, of course, dangerous, here again, is, is a pack bot. This robot, again, uh, has been used in Iraq and Af Af Afghanistan to look at uh, improvised explosive devices. There are also um, ChemBio uh, and nuclear hazards that robots are used to, to look, uh, to inspect, for example. Uh, just as a, a reminder, this, this is an improvised explosive device that was found in Iraq, uh, and I believe about 2005. Um, this is the result of um, uh, an IED blowing up a packbot. So obviously this is not a person, and so what the robot has done is taken the place of the person uh, and saving that person's life. life. Um, so here also is an iRobot packbot that's been uh, uh, sent into the, the reactor um, area in Fukushima, um, where humans obviously don't, don't want to go very often. So I came to talk about robot navigation. I want to set out what that, the lens through which I see that, and that will set up some of the challenges or frontiers that I'll talk about. First thing is estimating a world model, okay, often. Um, in an instance where I have an ICBM, I have a pre-programmed world model. However, a robot that's navigating through a world needs to update and create that model dynamically, okay? Uh, it has to know, for example, self-driving car, whether there's a person that I should not run into. Second part is state estimation, knowing where you are. Third being identifying some goal, Again, in the case of ICBM, that might be get here within some mile or some constraint. Uh, for driving, that might be getting from A to B. Uh, what I'll talk about is sort of more generalizing or abstracting the notion of a goal, okay, to extend this uh, uh, framework. Um, and then, of course, calculating a plan to achieve that goal. This is an example of uh, the work from the Urban Challenge in 2007, which I was um, lucky to be involved in. I was part of the Tartan Racing Team which was the first place winner. Um, it was a really an amazing moment in robotics. The first example where we had self-driving cars, there, there are no drivers in there, um, in, that, in that car, in any of those cars, and they were able to figure out who has the right of way, drive around, um, park themselves, and obey the rules of the road. They integrated perception technology, GPS technology, um, uh, path planning, uh, it was an amazing, um, amazing event. That work has culminated um, in the Google driverless car. So some of the work that Stanford did went into this, uh, into this project, for example, um, and which has driven, these are, these are the 2012 numbers, which has driven over 200,000 uh, miles, 1,000 miles without uh, any inter intervention. Um, I'm not gonna talk as much about these types of problems, robot navigation. Um, I think these folks at Google and at Nissan, which have declared that they're gonna make a self-driverless, uh, self-driving car by 2020, these are, these are, at this point, some well-understood problems. 
I'll talk about some of the challenges we'll, we'll nevertheless encounter that are related, but, but not necessarily in this space. Uh, so for example, as I said, Nissan announced plans to release a driverless car by 2020. That means that probably my kids who are five and three today aren't gonna need to learn how to drive a car. <laughs> um, it also probably means that the good question is whether how these are going to be introduced uh, in terms of socially accepted. Um, I think, for example, the, uh, the rates of insurance are probably going to go up for those who decide that they have to drive their car on their own, whereas those for uh, other vehicles will decrease. Mercedes is also investigating uh, driverless cars, having those ready by 2020. Um, so nevertheless, robots still have significant limitations. Many of the ones, uh, the ones that I showed of the IED inspecting robots, they're teleoperated. Um, the autonomy and the path planning and the world perception, the models, aren't sufficiently advanced at this point to allow them to let them loose. They're often blind uh, in the sense that they don't have, uh, at this point, the capability certainly not of a human. So my background is in computer vision. I work on making them more aware of their surroundings, but we're still not there, again, where we can let them loose. And also dependent. They're dependent on GPS um, and people for teleoperation, for example. So um, what are some of the frontiers? I'm going to uh, talk about what I think are some, what are some open challenges. Um, I'll put them in the context of uh, a couple scenarios, talk about three of them. Um, but let me start with the way in which we operate. Uh, the, this is a particular iRobot robot that it's operated today by joystick. Okay? This guy is looking at the robot that's driving down this alley. He is covered by another guy. That other guy is there so that he will be aware of other people that might shoot the guy who's operating the joystick. Okay? So there's actually a, a two to one ratio between people and robots. In the movies, there's thousands of robots in one person. That's not this movie. Okay? So a challenge is how we're going to get to human robot teams. For example, if we were to imagine a SWAT team, you know, we think about how a SWAT team works, people I'm talking about, they work together to achieve a goal that they would otherwise be unable to achieve individually. How do we get robots um, to work together with humans or amongst themselves um, to attain new, new types of uh, uh, team um, uh, objectives, for example? They'll have decision-making capabilities that will be much faster than ours. They'll be able to see things and sense things that we will not be able to see. Okay? So there's a significant potential for new types of teams, for example. Um, and that will certainly happen in factories, in hospitals, in the battlefield, and so on. So let me just consider a, a truer, potentially a truer robotic partner through a snippet of, a few snippets of videos just to show um, some initial work that we've done to, on this direction. So this particular robot here is um, that we've developed. That's me down in Georgia. I'm holding a controller, but I'm not using it to have it follow me. The robot instead sees me and knows that it should follow me. And what that does is allows me to be more aware of my surroundings. It allows me to not have to focus on the robot and control every, every movement. Okay. Um, here, example, is a different way of interacting with it. So I can send a signal that says, operate in a different way. Okay? Uh, and we did studies of these. Uh, we conducted studies, and this actually measurably improved performance. Um, however, we ran into a wall. We just couldn't communicate well enough with the robot or convey enough information in our signaling mechanisms, if you like, um, to convey what we wanted the robot to do. So I think a big challenge is a more effective human-robot teamwork, not just interaction, but teamwork. Good teams understand a common objective through context, through, uh, through learning, um, and they figure out how to use very few signals to figure out what my intent is and what our common goal is. Um, that's going to be, for a robot, now the goal is going to be a function of what my estimate of the intent of the team is. Okay? And so that space of intent could potentially be huge, right? If you think about possible objectives in the world, um, and so how do you reduce that space? How do you reduce that search space? How do you, through interactions, subtle interactions, reduce the search space 
attractively. Okay? And also, if, for example, I tell the robot to go down the hallway and turn left at the intersection and, and walk across, walk in front of a few doors, um, it has to know what a hallway is, the doors are, has to be able to associate what I've told it with, uh, with what it senses. And that's still a huge problem right now. So this is, um, I think, again, with the potential for the ability for the robots to make faster decisions, uh, to sense new things, a potential for, for new types of, of teams and, and, uh, and results. Um, here's another, so that's, that was number one. Number two uh, is about um, how can we get robots to be more ready to let loose, so to speak. So here's a picture of the World Trade Center. We know that um, many, many firefighters, hundreds um, of firefighters died at the World Trade Center in 9-11. Could a robot, could robots have gone in to save some of those people instead? Now, a robot, however, and, and in fact, uh, after the, after the um, event, iRobot sent robots down in there, okay? And we sent uh, the, pro pro uh, the PackPipe prototypes to look for, to help look for survivors. It was a challenge, though, because a robot, for example, at this point, can't solve problems like how do I open the door if it's blocked in my, if it's blocking my way. Um, another challenge was the particular sensors we used weren't able to see through the, the muck that was all around. Um, but even if they could, again, they can't solve the problems of how to, um, uh, um, for example, use an ax to chop down the door, for example. So a big problem is um, manipulation. And so this video shows some of the progress that has been made, but we're still far away from being able to, again, go through a wreckage or before there's a wreckage and be able to go and rescue someone and take them out. So here we are, uh, a robot is picking up um, a light, okay? And this is doing it slowly at this point, but it shows the potential for certainly improvements here. Um, but we still remain, um, there still remain challenges in terms of, um, for example, recognizing what things are. So this is a, a technology that we've developed at Irova to recognize objects. But here we only are able to recognize 20 objects um, and still need lots of processing power to do it. So still a lot of de development, needs, development needs to be done here. I think sort of to sum up, there has to be semantically rich, heterogeneous problem solving. Um, anybody watch MacGyver? This is a favorite show of mine as a kid. Um, we solve problems all the time. We figure out how to unstuck stuck wheels. Um, we use tools to change the world, and we think outside of the box. Uh, we don't, at this point, have uh, models that the robots are gathering from the world that are sufficiently rich to solve these types of problems. They don't have methods to represent those types of um, objects in the world. And um, they can't do the problem solving and, and uh, looking in those search uh, spaces to s solve the problems. Okay. Um, so, so that was one and two, and then for three, um, let me ask, is there anybody from New Jersey in here? <laughs> New Jersey areas, okay, okay. I'm a uh, licensed New York City pedestrian, which means that I grew up in New York City and I'm still alive, <laughs> and um, if I see somebody in a car who's got Jersey plates and I'm walking across the street, He's coming at me, I slow down. I know that the guy or woman, the person in the car will slow down because that person will want to stop and avoid me. When I see a yellow taxi cab, I run. <laughs> That's why I'm still alive. Okay? Um, question of aggression and how to solve, how to trade that off with getting to where I want to go is not currently solved. Um, I can think about more um, a larger problem, which might be a larger moral problem, which is suppose I have an autonomous vehicle that's barreling down the highway, and maybe a guy falls from the bridge, who knows, some scenario, um, and I might have to decide between crashing into the pedestrian or crashing into a school bus. Okay? 
how are we going to encode in the robot the ability to make what decision to make? What's the right decision? Um, what's the right decision if, if instead of a pedestrian, there's a Mercedes there, and I'm Google, and I can look up the guy's license plate, and he's a rich lawyer? What's the right decision? I don't know. <laughs> So in the, in the philosophy world, this is known as the trolley problem. Um, and we're going to have to really, before we get the cars out there and by 2020, have to figure out how to, maybe afterwards, figure out how to solve this type of problem. But really, moral judgments embedded in the robots. Okay? Uh, and this is much beyond uh, just a robotics problem. Again, this goes into philosophy. But how to encode perhaps moral principles? Are these order relations? Um, crash into x instead of y? What are the legal implications uh, of making that type of encoding those judgments into the robots? Um, who's going to be at fault if something happens? That's a big question. Okay. Um, so I think that generalized some of the notions that I was talking about uh, of the framework for robot navigation that, that roboticists often think about different types of world models that were improving the way that we estimate world models. Uh, not so much changes in state estimation, but well, uh, in terms of estimating the intent of people um, and identifying where to go, perhaps my, what, and what my constraints are uh, about, um, I can think about the constraints or how to trade off moral judgments. And again, also calculating uh, techniques to address larger uh, search spaces for looking for, for paths uh, in the world. Those are all challenges common, but I think there's other, I think there's a common sort of framework in which all these three uh, areas uh, have a, a unifying theme, which is there's often, and, and traditionally there's been a gap um, between the research that a lot of roboticists do and what traditional artificial intelligence does. And what we need to do is, and I think all of these three examples are, uh, three uh, challenges are examples of instances where we need to bridge the divide, okay, between what has traditionally been artificial intelligence and uh, robotics. How can we get robots to think into the future, extending the horizon over which they plan uh, in more complex environments with, with uncertainty and so on? Also doing so collaboratively ethically in complex worlds, uh, how can we, again, how can we bridge these uh, uh, disparate fields and disciplines? And with that, that's it. Oh, Christopher, thank you very much for a very uh, futuristic look at Robux, and it's coming fast, I, I gather, coming fast. Um, We'd, we'd like to um, uh, thank you very much for, for giving us this talk, and thank you officially. Uh, we have a, a certificate for you, and its citation reads as follows. In recognition of outstanding contributions to the field of robotics and presentations of his lecture on robot navigation at the National Academy of Engineering 2013 meeting. That's the inscription on the certificate, which is here, and we will get our picture snapped All right. here. Congratulations to you. Thank you very much. Great.